I'm a feminist, but... (laughs) Hello, Adelaide! (laughs) We weren't sure we'd see the day, but we have. (laughs) And I'm a feminist, but... I have already been in five cities in Australia and New Zealand, and four of my five drivers who've picked me up from the airport to take me to the hotel have been women. Yeah, it's great. No, obviously, I do support women drivers. (laughs) But my suitcase is for a five-week tour, so it's really, really heavy. And every time it's a woman driver, I have to go, oh, no, no, I'll put it in the boot. (laughs) Now, listen, I want more women, of course, want more women, everything. What I'm suggesting is that the state provide a man (laughs) to come with. Listen, the state don't even have to provide. It's just like jury duty. Men have to be on a roster one afternoon a year. And I'm not saying, like, indiscriminately, like in the wall, when they, like, you'd have to go for a test to see you were fit and you could carry, make sure you didn't have flat feet and all that. Do that, of course, the strong ones, but they should be, instead of jury duty, it should be like luggage labour, you know, something like that. Give it like a catchy title. Make them do it. Don't pay them. <laughs> 10,000 years of patriarchy, come on, we've got to get something back. That's all I'm suggesting. I'm a feminist, but... (laughs) Um, Just before I do my but, um, I could lift your suitcase in the back. (laughs) You will be tomorrow. Yeah, Yeah, that's going to happen. Look at those muscles. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm a feminist, but... uh, as happy as I was that the Termination of Pregnancy Act of 2021 finally came into law on the 7th of July in this state. Um, That is actually my birthday and I was jealous (laughs) that it took attention away from me. (laughs) It was your birthday and I mean, maybe that was a present. Oh, see, yeah, I should like, look at it that from, way. Yeah, yeah, from feminism. Thank you, feminism, for my wonderful birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> did, they, did feminism also send you a voucher? Uh, yeah, just uh, lots of thoughts and... No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted a voucher for a spa. I'm a feminist, but... On these really cold winter mornings when I don't want to get out of bed, I just think maybe the fourth wave of feminism needs to be for a woman's right not to work. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but... (laughs) I, I doubt myself all the time, right, in a way that I think that men really don't, you know, like I I got to Adelaide from the UK uh, two days ago and I've just been sitting in my hotel room sort of battling jet lag that entire time and uh, while I was watching Australian TV, I started to doubt whether I know how to count (laughs) the numbers because I was sitting there looking at the TV Stay with me on this. I was like, so, so the first channel is called 10. <laughs> then the third channel is called 1. Then we go straight to 7, then 9. No more numbers and one called Pete. <laughs> this is a lawless land. I do I've never thought of that. But you're 100% right. You never thought right. of even numbers <laughs> over here. I was raised if, if they not Aust- made it to Oz yet. I was raised in Australia. We had 7, 9 and 10. At, why? ABC, SBS, 7, 9, 10. And then we just skip to Peach. I don't fucking know. <laughs> yeah. I don't, it's, I mean... Man, yeah, Manal, c- explain your country. We also, I mean, I'll try, but I'm not really from here, so just cut me some slack. Um, 
99, we have like a bunch of really random ones. SBS was kind of like Channel 8 for a while, then it was Channel 3. So we really just do what we want. Listen, yeah. also, if you um, lived regionally back in the 80s, you just got two channels. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It was ABC and all the good bits from everything else. It's a wonder you haven't had a plebiscite on this. I mean, that is your answer to everything, isn't it? Plebiscites. Yeah, like... well, no, yeah, we've had a couple. <laughs> Every time I turn around, there's a plebiscite and a new prime minister. And what I always used to think was, have you tried eHarmony Australia? But <laughs> finally, it looks like you might have got it right, or at least a better yeah, version. Yeah, we've, we've got yeah? it. Like, hope, hope. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you have hope now, Joe? Absolutely. The, the morning after the election, Jesus, sun was a bit brighter. <laughs> I also, I saw a, um, a, a wombat and anechid, an, an echidna. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like nature knew as well. It was like, yeah, we're getting out. We can come out now. Are you suggesting that native... Australian fauna had been hiding from Scott Morrison. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're suggesting? And are now emboldened. I hope, I hope that all of the really dangerous ones aren't emboldened, though, because there's a lot of stuff here that wants to kill you. No, they like, they're, they're out as well, but they're like, oh, yeah, you're all right, mate. And then <laughs> are you, are you now suggesting that the poisonous indigenous spiders and snakes of Australia yeah. believe themselves to be voted out when the Liberal Party gets voted out and no, don't attack? No, I believe that they know who I voted for. <laughs> and they, so when I come across like a tiger snake on the path, he'll, that tiny little face will look up at me and its beady little eyes will go, I know. <laughs> Are we ready to start the show? <laughs> Then welcome, welcome, welcome to the Guilty Feminists! A huge round of applause for Geraldine Hickey, Manal Yunus, Grace Petrie! Three incredible women you will be seeing a lot more of this evening! Hello, Adelaide. You're a long way away, and Adelaide, often that's how I feel about you as a city in Australia. But this is ridiculous. I feel like the stage, there's this moat between me and you. Normally I like to like, I, lately I've been sort of like, you know, just doing that slightly, you know, I mean, it's a bit rock star really. And I've been, listen, we had a very long lockdown in London. We didn't touch anyone for what feels like about 12 years. So if you don't mind me saying so, you seem too far away right now. I would snog you if COVID regulations allowed, but I don't think they do, do they? There's no snogging yet, is there? We're just grateful to be out of the house. Presumably nobody in Adelaide snogged anyone for the duration of the lockdown, and people are still being quite careful. I mean, within, if you were in a bubble, just give us a cheer if you were in a snogging bubble during the lockdown. Or, or in the, yes, you waved, like there was something, but you waved as if that was quite, it was quite flirtatious. Is, you're not married to the person you were snogging, are you? I could tell by the way you went. It was your choice. I hope it was your choice. Yeah, that's, that's very key. Very big on consensual snogging. Uh, it's your choice to be what? It's, it's my choice to snog the person I'm married to. It's your choice to snog the person you're married to. It's a very feminist audience, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I am. Mar Is it, I, I don't want to make a heteronormative assumption here. To whom are you married? He's male. Okay, so... A giant man. Your friends are confirming that. They're all like, he is a giant man. He is a giant man. You're, how tall is this man? 6'4". You sound like you're North American. Yeah, I, thank you. That's the confidence of a North American, isn't it? I am, thank you. The assumption that that is a compliment... Given recent years. I assume you must be Canadian. You're from Atlanta, Georgia. It, you, sorry, I, we're going to need more time together. What's your name? I moved here in 2016. It was very long. Oh, 
was very well timed. So you moved here in 2016. So you moved from Atlanta, Georgia to Adelaide. I'm surprised if I'm absolutely honest, and this has no aspersions on anyone in Atlanta, but I'm surprised you knew where Adelaide was and could identify it as a place in Australia that anyone could go to. Because I'll be honest, Adel- and I love Adelaide. This is the place where I had the best festival of my life. There were two big things that happened that embedded my feminism in a way that I honestly, genuinely believe this. I would not have started the Guilty Feminist podcast if I hadn't come to Adelaide. 2011. So I love Adelaide. But I'll be honest with you, sometimes Australia forgets about Adelaide. So how did you in Georgia know about Adelaide? The tall man! Oh, here we go. So the tall man came from Adelaide to Georgia and you met him in a, what, were you in a bar or? You, it was supposed to be a hookup. It, it was just, what do you mean it was supposed to be a hookup? What does that mean? You thought it was a genius move on your part to hook up with a tall man. I wouldn't call that a genius move. Again, the confidence of an American. A genius move. I'm going to hook up with a man taller than me. I, I am the 21st century Einstein. Uh, how did you... But what do you mean? It was just meant to be a hookup. So you thought, oh, I'm just going to hook up with this guy. How did you meet him? Was it on an app? Oh, you thought, I'll never run into him because he's from Adelaide. I see. Now this is making more sense now. So there you are in Georgia, thinking to yourself, I'll hook up with this South Australian because the chances of me ever seeing him again are zero. And then you accidentally followed him back. (laughs) And then here you are. So one thing led to shagging. And then shagging led to marriage. And now you live here. 2016, you exited... God, what brilliant timing, though. Thank God, because as you left with your giant man, another giant man went into the White House. And that seems to have gone horribly wrong. I don't know if you've heard about latest developments, but although said giant man is now mostly playing golf and bitching, um, uh, his effect lives on because of the Supreme Court nomination. Um, So uh, you are now here, and are you a Guilty Feminist listener? Are you, do you listen to The Guilty Feminist? Uh, no, actually. You don't. <laughs> now, again, it is the confidence of an American. At this point, I'm surprised you're not a man. Because <laughs> you've never listened to The Guilty Feminist, and yet we're having a long conversation, and this sometimes happens, but only with men. Where they go, no, in Britain they'll go, no, she bought the tickets, I don't know why I'm here. But they've raised their hand and asked to speak to me. And I'm always like, if I were at a men's rights activist conference, accidentally, or for research, I would go for research. I would be desperate to go for research. I want to know what they're saying. But if someone pointed at me and said, uh, certainly I wouldn't sit in the front row. There's always men in the front row, always men in the front row. And I don't want to impose gender on anyone in the front row. But if you are a man and in the front row, just wave. Because there will be men. Yeah, here they go. Here they go. They're waving. They're waving. Can I just ask you, what makes you sit in the front row, in the centre of the front row, sir? What makes you do that? Male ego. Oh, it is. I thought you were going to say, oh, it's just where we got the ticket. I don't know. Someone else bought it. You actually wanted to sit there. It was given to you, like everything else in life, sir. I don't want to assume you're a white, cis, straight man, but the way you said it was just given to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I'd put a lot of money on that. I would remortgage my house. Two out of three. Uh, you're white and cis. Not straight. Oh, well, that's good. That's... Not that there's anything wrong with being a white, straight, cis man. Don't be, I, don't, I just mean that's good because I feel we'll be friends. Um... It's got awkward now. You've come with other people. I don't want to steal you. Um, so thank you so much for coming, everyone who's come. Um, so if you, just give us a cheer if you listen to the podcast. Give us a cheer if you don't know where you're at. Okay. Notice how those cheers are less definite 
less bold, less feminist, if you will. But don't worry, by the end of the show, you'll understand. Uh, this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast about our noble goals as 21st century feminists and our hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Tonight we have an incredible show for you. Um, before I bring Geraldine on, I just want to ask you, I've been asking different audiences around the UK, um, have you done any feminism since I saw you last? Because I haven't been in Australia for two and a half years. I haven't seen anyone in my family for two and a half years. And I haven't had one guilty feminist audience in Australia or New Zealand for two and a half years. And it's, I've built the show here really as much as the UK. I've come out every single year. So... Um, I'm just so desperate to be in your company again and so desperate to be with our incredible Australian Guilty Feminist audiences. Can I ask you, has anyone done anything feminist since I saw you last? Yeah. Fuck yeah, great. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to start with you and I'll tell you why. I asked this in London and a woman put her hand up and said, yes, uh, I raised £200,000 to take the Met Police to court because they said we couldn't have a vigil. Really super, super feminist case. We have now set precedent in law that the Met Police... Uh, legally stopped us having this vigil. Um, it was an absolutely extraordinary thing, and everyone cheered. And uh, her name is Jamie Klingler, and uh, the group is called Reclaim These Streets. Everybody cheered. And then I said, has anyone else done anything? And everyone went, no, no, I've done nothing with my life at all. I just, I don't know why I'm here. And I'll be honest, while a brilliant act of feminism, it did dispirit everyone. So... <laughs> I've started asking for a small act of feminism, something that is going to intimidate nobody. I want the smallest act of feminism so others are going to go, I can do better than that. Encourage us. Now, I'm going to come to you because you've got something good, but I already know it's too good. It's too, whatever it is, it's too good. I said this the other day, and we were in, um, in like Newcastle or somewhere, and someone put her hand up and said, I co-founded. I went, no, that's too much. I, no, what, most people here will never have co-founded anything and they're never going to. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear, I haven't shaved my legs for two weeks until tonight when I thought they really could be. Yeah, no, I'm going out now. Uh, you know, what, they want to hear some low-level shit. So can, has anyone got anything what they think will intimidate nobody? Yes. What's your name? Jude. And what's your thing, Jude? Emboldened by Stranger Things. Okay. So I'm just going to say this into the microphone for the, um, for, the, for the audience at home. Okay, so emboldened by Stranger Things, you went away with your teenage boys and you said, I can play Dungeons and Dragons. You couldn't. Okay. <laughs> Turns out no. Turns out no. But you tried. You had a go. You put the little things on the board. They said, no, you're doing it wrong, mum. And then you went, this is really for boys. I'm leaving you to it. And you said, some things really are gendered. The binary is useful on some occasions. I'm on holidays. I don't really want to fuck with this. I might conjure a spirit. I've seen Stranger Things. I know what happened to an owner rider. Do you know what? I'm not down for that kind of holiday. I don't want to summon a large spirit beast. I just want to read my magazines and look out the window what was that you sat by the pool yeah yeah absolutely rightly so rightly so I, I have never played Dungeons and Dragons I fancy myself I'd be quite good at it and that is why I must never do it someone over here what was yours what's your name Erin You signed up to donate a, bun a box of pads once a month to a homeless shelter? Yep. That's it. That's it, okay. <laughs> you can see how that's already too good. Because that is useful. What was that? It's only $7 a month. It's only $7 a month, yeah. Adelaide, we're going to need lower standards because that's really useful. And that's, that's a small thing that you can do that really is, you know it's directly contributing and it's making a difference. So I will allow it because it's only one box. But if it were more than one box, I'd be like... I'd be like, okay. So anybody got anything where they think, okay, I can match. You can match, you could go higher or lower, but you just have to shout it out. 
I can teach you Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, I'm going to say that's higher. That's higher than yours, lower than yours. Okay, what's your name? Lydia. And what's your name? Jude, that's right. So Lydia Jude, and Jude, in the interval, you've got to find each other. Jude, could you just stand up and wave so she can identify you? She's the one who looks like a mum of teenage boys who has no interest in playing Dungeons and Dragons and wants to sit by a pool. If you see her, what was that? You work at what? You work at a games company that does Dungeons and Dragons. Stop it. Genuinely, you're here on a work outing from Dungeons and Dragons. What are the fucking chances? This is incredible. Oh my God, this is the greatest night of my or anyone's life. You need to tell us more. I didn't know women ran Dungeons and Dragons. How many are there of you? When you started, it was mostly boys. Yeah. Oh, because of Stranger Things representation, 50-50. 50% of women of Dungeons and Dragons. So do you know what I thought you were going to say is we've always been run by women. It was invented by women to distract men so we could get on with feminism while they weren't looking. I thought that. Um, I'm going to come back to you who said hell yeah after our first comedian of the evening. Hello, Guilty Feminists, it's Deborah. We will be at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe on the 25th, the 26th, the 27th and the 28th of August at the Gilded Balloon TV at 2pm. Get your tickets now. We'll have some incredible co-hosts and guests. Also, we're part of the London Podcast Festival on Saturday, the 10th of September at King's Place. I'm very excited to say we are doing a crossover episode with Brown Girls Do It Too, one of our favourite ever podcasts. And we're bringing back Global Pillage for one special episode. Get your tickets now. Our seventh birthday show will be on the 1st of October. Current lineup includes Rachel Paris. So exciting from the MASH report. Desiree Birch and Sindhu V, guilty feminist favorites from all over your television. Kima Bob, a guilty feminist regular from Fuck It Up. And Grace Petrie as well as Susan McComa in the co-host chair on the sofa and some very exciting guests to be announced, including a very big musical guest star. We will reveal more names as we are able to, but in the meantime, get your tickets now. It is going to be the Guilty Feminist event of our lifetime, 1st of October at the Hammersmith Apollo. Yes, live at the Apollo. Don't miss it. For tickets for all these things, go to guiltyfeminist.com. If you would like ad-free episodes and exclusive offers, join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash guiltyfeminist. And now back to the podcast. Are you ready for some stand-up comedy? She is one of my very favourite people to perform with and watch. Uh, She is one of Australia's most important comedians. That's how I'm going to introduce her. Um, Yeah, I think she's uh, an actual phenomenon. Put your hands together and make incredible Guilty Feminist Adelaide welcoming noises for the wonderful Geraldine Hickey! Sup, fuckers. Um, I, uh, I'm from Victoria, um, so, yeah. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm from the state that had the most lockdowns. Um, and there was one day, like, um, I, in, I, I went to Tasmania, had some work in, in Hobart, and the day after I arrived in Hobart, Victoria went into its last lockdown. And I went, well, I'm not going home. Um, and then I went, I should tell my partner. Um, <laughs> so I rang, I rang her, and, and Kath is her name, and she went, babe, I think you should stay. Like, I don't think you should come home. And I thought, oh, really? That, oh. <laughs> what a great idea. 
all right, I'll stay. Uh, I, was, um, I was supposed to have been in Hobart for four nights and I came home two months later. <laughs> yeah, I'll, it's fine. I took full advantage of that time out. This thing, like when you're a Victorian and you find yourself in a state that isn't in lockdown when the rest of your state is, pressure is on to get out. Do you know, like I would wake up in my hotel room, I'd be hung over from being out to like 9.30 the night before. <laughs> and, and I'd go, do you know what, I think I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay in bed, I'm just going to hang out here today, just watch a bit of TV, I'll order some food in, I'll just, I'll just relax here at the hotel. And then the Victorian side of me would be like, don't you dare. <laughs> get up, get outside, go on, get out. Go have a coffee. Let's go get a coffee. Let's sit in the cafe and have a coffee. Let's go for a walk. Yeah, keep walking. Keep past the five Ks. Keep going. We can keep going. I got a manicure while I was out. Yeah. I don't like manicures. <laughs> that filing, I hate the way that feels. That is so irritating, but don't worry, I trim my nails. I'm a good lesbian. Um, <laughs> but... But I got a manicure because Victoria couldn't, so <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> there was, I just, yeah, I took full advantage of, of, of my time. It meant that I could, you know, keep on working and I did a lot of travelling. I went to Western Australia, they let me in. <laughs> um, no, they let me in because I'd been in Tassie for two weeks, so that's the same as doing quarantine. Um, <laughs> But I was in Western Australia and I went, oh, okay, here we go. Let's, how do we step this up a bit? Let's, come on, let's take, let's have, do something fun. And I went, do you know what? I'm going to go to Monkey Mire, right? Now, some people might not know Monkey Mire. I know Monkey Mire because that's where the twins, Brooke and Sebastian, that I went to primary school with, um, <laughs> that's where they went on a family holiday... <laughs> And they came back and told me about it when we were in primary school. And I was like, oh, my God, that, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and then I went home to my mum and dad and was like, mum, dad, our next family holiday, can we all put, like, me, you guys, my brother and my four sisters, can all of us <laughs> please go to Monkey Mire? Um, and mum and dad laughed. Um, <laughs> And I went, please, I started pleading, please, please. And then my mum started singing, she's got high hopes, she's got high hopes. So we didn't go. Um, so last year when I was in Western Australia, I went, I'm going to go to Monkey Mire, right? Now, Monkey Mire, for those that don't know, it's north of Perth and it's in a place called Shark Bay, and there is a dolphin population there. And then in the, like, 70s, 80s, into the early 90s, you used to be able to interact with the dolphins. Yeah? You get in, swim with the dolphins, you go up to the shop, buy a bucket of fish, walk down into the water, hold out a fish, feed a dolphin, go, there you go, flipper, give it a little tickle under the chin, have a great day, right? <laughs> There'd be, like, lots of fishermen about in their boats, and they'd be, like, halfway through their fish and chips, and they'd have a dim sim, and they'd go, I've had enough of this dim sim. There you go, mate. And just toss it into to a dolphin, right? Eventually they did work out that this is not good <laughs> for dolphins. Um, in fact, they, were, uh, they did research and found out that 90% of the population, uh, the population of dolphins were dying um, because the dolphins were breeding, the dolphins were having calves, but the calves weren't surviving because it is pretty tricky to teach a dolphin to hunt for dim sim. Um, <laughs> So they put a ban on it, um, like interacting with the dolphins. So, but you can still, they still feed the dolphins, but it's under a very controlled, strict environment. Um, and you can go watch a feeding. So I did that. 6.30 in the morning, they do the, they do the first feeding and you rock up um, and you get to put your feet in the water and there's a few dolphins there and the dolphins are swimming up and down and there's a ranger doing a talk, you know, talking about the history of the dolphins, uh, the research that they've done and why they feed the dolphins and lots of, you know, amazing stuff. Um, and then at the end of that... 
uh, the ranger goes, okay, uh, what's going to happen now? So volunteers will come out and they will choose three people at random to come out and feed a dolphin. Okay, now it's completely at random, just completely at random, all right? We don't want you waving your arms about going, oh, pick me, pick me, I love dolphins, I love them, all right? We just, you know, we want to be calm, okay? So don't be pointing at your friends either. Don't be pointing at your friend going, oh, this one, he loves dolphins, get him in, get him in, he loves them, right? We just, we just got to be calm and collected because it's, we're just going to pick people at random, okay? Completely at random. Um, which means, you know, the morning I was there, there was like 100, 150 people lined up along the beach, right? So 150 people. So as the volunteers came out, it just meant that all those people were like this. I looked around, right, and went, I reckon I might be in with a shot here. <laughs> yeah. People around me look pretty beige. <laughs> yeah. But then right at the last minute, this family comes in and this, um, this kid stands next to me. He's like 10 years old and he's wearing a rashie with a dolphin on it. <laughs> yeah. And he's clutching a plush toy that is a dolphin, right? <laughs> So I can see the volunteers coming up and I'm looking at the volunteers and I'm just looking at her thinking, don't pick the kid. Come on, don't pick the kid. He's got his whole life for this. Yeah, don't pick the kid. Pick the 42-year-old that's there on her own, yeah? What's her story? <laughs> she might need this a bit more than him, yeah? They picked the kid, right? <laughs> Obviously, they picked the kid. You know, they picked the kid, and um, he starts walking out, and they go, "Oh, you can bring your family out with you." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm his mum." Um, <laughs> but he, I mean, he was so excited. He so he has, his little sister followed him, and he stopped and he turned to his sister and just went, oh, "I can't believe I got picked." And I was like, "I can, mate. Look at you." you know? <laughs> Anyway, he loved it. Oh, my God, he loved it so much. Even when it was all over, like 20 minutes later, I saw him sitting on the beach, still blissed out by the whole experience. And I was like, I went up to him and I said, hey, mate, are you having the best day of your life? And he looks up at me and just goes, yeah, I'm the dolphin whisperer. <laughs> Oh, I had um, one night booked at Monkey Mire, uh, so I booked four more nights. <laughs> I went, I've got to feed a dolphin. <laughs> I want that, right? <laughs> so I'd rock up every morning. Six, there'd be three feeding, 6.30, 7, 7.30. I would be at all of them. So everyone would be looking at the dolphins. I'd be looking at the range the whole time, just paying full attention to what they had. To, oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yesterday you said that um, they like to come in at a bit. Oh, is that right? Yeah, really interesting. Mm. Yeah, that, oh, that's right. I was here earlier. That's right. Yeah, that's me. It's me again. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yes. Um, the hot tip I got, though, was uh, someone told me that to wear something bright. So when the volunteers come out, that's what they look for. They look for people with bright clothing so they can go, oh, you in the pink top, out you come. So it's just easy for, to bring people out. So um, I went, righty -o. Next day I've rocked up purple shorts, check shirt, sailor's hat. <laughs> come on. And then it happened in the, in the last session of the day, less people, so more chances. <laughs> Happened. The volunteer came along and she stood in front of me and she pointed towards me and she went, you. And I was like, oh, I was so, like, cause I was so excited because I never get picked for anything, yeah? Like, I never get picked. Um, okay, that's a lie. <laughs> I got picked first for softball all through primary school and high school. Like, look at me. <laughs> So, anyway, but she looked, she stopped in front of me and she went, you. And I went, me? And she went, no. And I went, oh. What? And she went, oh, sorry, yes, y yes, you, yeah. Me? And she went, no, yeah, yeah. 
I'm like, you kind of ruined the moment. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's fine. Um, so uh, I went out and... Um, oh, yeah, this is the other... Oh, I don't actually like dolphins that much. <laughs> Just, don't, they're great. They're good, you know, good on them. <laughs> They're just not as great as they think they are. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> but very excited about having an interaction with a, with a wild animal, right? So um, they gave me, the, gave me a fish, and uh, Piccolo was the name of the dolphin that I was feeding. And so I held the fish out, and then Piccolo swam forward, and then she grabbed the, the other end of the fish in her mouth, and she just held it there. Right, so there was this moment where we're both just holding on to this fish. And I was looking at her, and it's almost like she was looking back at me, just going, hey, how cool is this? <laughs> I was like, Piccolo, this is pretty cool. <laughs> and then Piccolo had a calf, and her calf swam around the back of me and like brushed the back of my leg. And I was like, oh, is that your kid? And she went, yeah, that's my kid. I'm like, what's its name? And she went, oh... That's, that's El Grande. And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a great name, El, El Grande. That's a great name, Piccolo. <laughs> then the volunteer was like, okay, you can let go of the fish now. I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, it looks like there's a new dolphin whisperer in town. And, uh, <laughs> that's me. Um, you're the best, Adelaide. Thanks so much. I've been joining here. Geraldine Hickey, everybody! Um, you may have noticed that I've got a sparkly cape on that says Guilty Feminist on the back. Um, that's mostly because I want you to feel you've had your money's worth. That's right. I haven't come all this way to not dress in sequins, um, but when I was backstage, um, I was saying, yeah, because, you know, I, I want to look like a superhero because um, I think it helps my feminism if I, you know, you put on a cape and you're like, yeah, I can do stuff. Um, but then I realised I was wearing my glasses and I was like, I'm kind of like Clark Kent and Superman. Like, at the, it's like I've worn both costumes. Um, and then Manal said, mm, I'm getting more of a Harry Potter vibe. <laughs> so I just need by a cheer. So if you think I'm more of the superhero variety, cheer now. Do you think I'm more of the wizard variety, Chinnow? <laughs> Manal Harry Potter wins. Um, you were correct. Um, so, could I just ask you, you know you who said fuck yeah, um, what's your act of feminism? It's funny because um, I've been doing it for a long time. I just quietly berate my single boyfriends, my straight boyfriends. I quietly berate my straight boyfriends. We could have had you a lot earlier, as it turns out. I was so worried you were just gonna, you were just thrilled with your life. It wasn't that you were like, yes, everyone's gotta get involved in this. You don't want anyone else involved in this. This is your pleasure. Is this hot? Is this a feminism or more a hobby? You've just been doing it for a long time. Yeah, you've been put, she's been putting hours in. She's in the trenches, guys, okay? So. She's in the feminist trenches. I hope you're nice to them as well, though. How many other of them, just to be clear? Enough. Enough. They're nice to me, I'm nice to them, but um, I hope they're more feminist now. You think, basically, what you're saying is, when you date men, they become more feminist because they've dated you. Yeah, they do. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Just give us a cheer if you think you've ever dated a man and left them more feminist than you found them. Yeah. You are doing the Lord's work. And listen, it just makes good sense because we're all in the same dating pool here in Adelaide. And you're passing, you're passing it on to a sister. So if everyone's doing the work, the pool should be getting better and better and better. Does Bumble tell that story here? What's the dating app that people use in Adelaide? Tinder. Okay. Why? That's the I hook up at. Do you not have any of the ones that are sort of for uh, getting to know you? You've only got Tinder in Adelaide. Just hinge. Hinge. Uh, is it, do you feel like the dating pool is getting more feminist? Is your work working? Okay, we've got to have a guilty feminist dating app. 
and it's only your exes that you approve. <laughs> That's a dating app worth being on. That's a dating app worth being on. You have to recommend an ex. And you also have to give them a rating of how feminist they were when you met them and how feminist they are now, you're releasing them into the wild. This would take off, Adelaide. This would take off. All right, these are just suggestions. If anyone's got money to invest, please do. Um, but I will say also to Layla and the whole Dungeons and Dragons crew, um, did you hear the episode we did with Minnie Bobby Brown? You did, yeah. She's, this is, for her 18th birthday, she asked to come on The Guilty Feminist. That was her present to herself. I know, and it's an amazing episode if you haven't heard it. She's incredible because she was a child and she started producing and wanting to create more parts for other women and she'd tell feminist stories. That's how she came to do Enola Holmes. Um, she's absolutely incredible. So I just messaged her backstage and said, I've just met these women who run Dungeons and Dragons in Australia and they've told us the, the gender ratio. She'll be so excited. She's just going to flip out. She'll probably cry. Um, so if she gets back now, I don't know what time it is over there, um, but if she gets back, I'll let you know. And, uh, and if not, I'll get your email or something and I'll, I'll see if I can, uh, I can pass on anything she says because I know she's going to be super, super excited about it. Maybe it could be a subsection of the dating app, Dungeons and Dragons exes that I approve. Oh, I'm too sad. Um, okay. All right. Our next act is going to be doing some extraordinary poetry, originally from Eritrea. She uses her writing and performance to create experiences that encourage audiences to join her in asking questions of themselves and the world around them. Please welcome to the stage, Manal Yunus! Girl, sometimes I forget that I am just a girl. That that's what they'll see. That my worth is determined by and against the worth of our men. That although he would be nothing without a woman or a girl, it's a man's world. And sometimes I forget that a girl can become a woman. And a woman is like a tree rooted so deeply into this earth that she cannot possibly fall. Instead, she grows. Antiquity gracing her bark in the form of wrinkles, folds and stretch marks, marking her more beautiful and from her... Leaves grow. Life is breathed into this globe. She is a breath of fresh air. Yet we keep comparing her just to the flowers that she gives, pretty and delicate, when these are only byproducts of what she really offers. Thank you. And sometimes I forget that I am weighed down by expectations of raising children instead of changing nations. Stop Housekeeping and other obligations stop me from pursuing my original inclinations and my gifts. My gifts feel like a burden. And other times I forget that my hips carry the world. Despite how narrow they are or how they may widen beside my pelvis, new life within my chest, the stories of history beneath my skull, the knowledge of time. Woman, you are priceless. Yet we put you on a price list because of what you wear or if you choose to spend your days in an office, a school, or simply taking care of your family. And you should never be made ashamed for loving independence or domesticity because it's just another case of being told who you should and shouldn't be. Woman, laugh. Because your complexity can never be understood. Because your power is more powerful than could ever be known, I pray that your hips fiercely throw aside anyone who tries to stop your music. And that the length of measuring tape it takes to hug your waist never be determined by the desires of someone else's taste. Woman, the burden is not what you are, but who you are asked to be. Woman, just be. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, that's very lovely. I'm not gonna try to do anything spectacular like take this off and walk around and chat. 
Um, yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. I also want to acknowledge um, that we're here on Ghana country. I'd like to acknowledge that I've been raised by Ghana country and acknowledge the women that for thousands of years have been caring for this land and done so much for it. Um, and just considering in anything that we do and any movement and any um, conversation around progress in the society, whether it be feminism, anti-racism and things like that, um, First Nations first and First Nations voices first. Um, I also want to thank you. I agree. Let's do that. Um, I feel very privileged to be on this land. I don't know. There's something like um, I had like a set kind of worked out and then I heard everybody else and then I was like, oh, it doesn't have to be deep <laughs> and it doesn't have to be political and I can say whatever I want. And so then my mind was kind of like running around backstage and then I was just like, okay, okay, fine, just choose something. And I was like, everything I have is deep and political because I feel like <laughs> that's basically just how I communicate. Um, but I also, I, I have one other poem that I really want to um, dedicate to all the women that I work with because um, I'm on the board of Writers SA and I work um, at Action Now Theatre and we have like socially justice focused um, theatre. And yes, thank you. And so we directly tackle, use the arts to tackle some of these issues and to platform voices. And um, then right beneath us in our building is the Working with Working Women's Centre, which is also amazing. Yes. Are there Working with Women's Centre people here? Yes, of course there is. Um, and I just think that, like, I feel as though everywhere I go in the spaces that I walk into, like, it's almost like a bubble. <laughs> I know it's a bubble, but it's just like... It's women, and we're paving the way. Women, non-binary, femme, and so on, and I should definitely be more conscious about my language around that. Um, but really, like, it's big things, and it's amazing, and I'm constantly inspired by that. So all my shit is deep. Um, and <laughs> but uh, thanks for listening. So my last poem. I'm carrying this bulky book, but I kind of feel like, feel like some trust has been built. So I can let you know it's actually just because I'm reading from my phone, but I felt like it looked tacky. So, <laughs> so. <clears throat> this is dedicated to all the incredible women in my life, um, women from all walks of life, um, women back home, women in my family, uh, women of color that have paved the way for me, before me. Um, You must carve windows into the doors that your keys won't open. And it can be tiring. While you're climbing through makeshift windows and loopholes, leaping through stepping stones that float on nothingness. While you carry the bruises from every footprint on your back, every strain on your shoulder blade. Know that sometimes your fight will be against parts of the very body that you treasure. So hold the corners of your lips in place. Say a few words, but make sure everyone reverberates in the rooms that have been kept from your reach. Then catch the little bit of breath that is still yours, that you haven't yet wasted on justifying you. And finally, though it may never come, keep waiting for the day that your being is no longer a protest. Thank you. I love that I still committed to holding the book up, I, even after I told you. But. Manal Yunus, everybody! Thank you. Um, Manal, can you tell us a little bit about your work? And crucially, where can we see more of it? Uh, ooh, so you can, on my website, it's kind of a place that's collected all the videos. There's a few things on YouTube. Um, you can always check out, check out Act Now Theatre. We um, have a lot of stuff going out, and I work on some blogs on that as well that kind of look at current issues. Um, yeah, they're kind of the main things. Excellent. And can we yeah. buy any of it printed? Uh, yeah, so I do have a book of poetry called Reap, which you can get on my website. Um, this is the last print runner, and then I'm never printing it again because it's, it was published many years ago now, and it's time to let go. So a new one hopefully soon, but we getting quick. New one soon, so yeah. look out for everything uh, that Manal is doing. Mm -hmm. Is there any other way in which we can support you and your work? Um, I think less support me and my work and more support what it's about. Um, so checking out things like um, there are local poetry nights like Soul Lounge that are really um, put, uh, put voices front and centre of people of colour um, and really look at the politics around these things, around platforms, so going to stuff like that. I'm um, checking out Act Now Theatre work, having conversations um, and 
Yeah, that's probably more important to me, yeah. Wonderful. Um, and what an incredibly feminist answer. Um, <laughs> so that night's in Adelaide, is it? Uh, yeah, so it's usually the last Friday, Saturday, or Sunday of every month. I can't keep up, to be honest. But um, yeah, and if you just look up Soul Lounge Adelaide. What's it called? Soul Lounge. Soul Lounge. So Soul Lounge Adelaide. Now we know, you in the room, you're the kind of people that leave the house and go to live events, <laughs> by definition. So I want every one of you to go to Soul Lounge uh, to see this night between now and the end of the year. Uh, just give us a cheer if you're committed to that. <laughs> Go out and support. It's such a feminist act to support artists of colour. And you've got it right here. And it's going to be one of those wonderful nights that refuels you for the rest of time. Uh, big round of applause for Manal Yunus. Thank you. So that was the first half. Join us for part two, which should be in your feed right now.